Here, the blessed Apostle Paul rebukes the Galatian believers because they've allowed themselves to be knocked off course. They've been sidelined and sidetracked in the race of the Christian life. And under divine inspiration, Paul reminds them that they were once running faithfully for the cause of Christ. But he acknowledges that something, indeed someone, has hindered them. They've been knocked out of the race, hindered as it were, by someone else. And Paul, moved by the Holy Ghost, encourages them to get back in the race. Now before we dissect these two verses, I want to acknowledge there are at least three groups of people in this assembly today. Some of you are not in the Christian race because you've never been saved. You've never entered the race. Now, you know that my practice is not to try to make church members doubt their salvation, but I will say there's good reason for some church members to doubt their salvation because you don't have any salvation. You may have walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, joined the church, gone through the baptistry, but you've never genuinely, truly, sincerely repented of sin and turned in believing faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never truly been saved. There's some of those in the room today. You've never entered the Christian race. There are some others, perhaps just a few. You're in the race and you're faithfully running the race. As best you know, you're serving the Lord with faithfulness and commitment. As best you know, your sin account is up to date. You're faithfully running the race. I would encourage you, if you are faithfully running, it's not you, but it's Christ. Paul said, if there's any good in me, it is not I, but Christ, or As my friend Dr. Ron Lynch likes to say, if there's anything good in you, it's not you, but it's Jesus. If there's anything bad in you, that's not Jesus. The bad is all you. (laughs) But I think there are a lot of us today that would have to say, I'm in the race. And I've run the race. And I may be running the race even today, but I'm not running as fervently and faithfully as I have in the past. And to you, the Apostle Paul still beckons out and billows out this statement. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. Now for the next several minutes, our ride is going to be a little bit bumpy. So like a good pilot, I want to let you know there's going to be a little choppy air, a little bit of turbulence, but we're going to have a safe, smooth landing in just a few moments. So let me go ahead and tell you where we're going to go in this message. I want you to consider with me that there is glory in a faithful race. There's grief over a faltering race, but there's grace for a further race. Let's examine this first truth. There's glory in a faithful race. Paul said, ye did run well. You were running well. I just want to say from the outset, it's possible to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Paul would later testify that he had fought a good fight. He had finished his course and kept the faith. In a world of charlatans, hypocrites, and phonies, sometimes we think that running the race well is an elusive pipe dream that it's not even possible. But the Holy Ghost says of these early Galatian believers, you were running well. So lean in close, Christian friend, and listen. It's possible to faithfully serve the Lord. Students, you don't have to be a casualty. You don't have to have a testimony that you served the Lord and then fell away and then came back. Thank God when you fall away, you can come back, but that doesn't have to be your testimony. You can bring glory to Christ through faithfully running the race. Now, there are two things that I think will help us faithfully run to God's glory. Number one is to notice that we've got a distinct assignment. Paul doesn't merely say that uh, Christians run well. He's got a specific congregation in mind, and I believe specific individual Christians in mind. You were running well. You see, friend, when you were saved that very moment, the Lord gave you the precious gift of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 verse 9 says, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Jesus. There's no such thing 
as a Christian that does not have the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came to indwell you at the moment of salvation, He came bringing and bearing a spiritual gift, enabling and equipping you to do something, at least one specific act of service for the glory of God. And one of the most frustrating things you'll ever do is try to operate in somebody else's giftedness. To try to do something that God hasn't called you to do. When Paul asked them who hindered you, he actually knows the answer to that question. Historically, the, the hinderers were called the Judaizers. In the region of Asia Minor, these Galatian churches had heard the gospel and they had been saved. But then some former Jews who were now Christians came from the city of Jerusalem. And they began to teach the Christians in Galatia that you need more than just Jesus to be saved. Uh, specifically, they said to the men of Galatia, you've got to have Jesus. I mean, you need grace and faith. You need all of those things. Plus, they told the men, you've got to be circumcised. Now, circumcision just symbolized uh, all of the Old Testament laws. They were essentially saying, you, you need Jesus plus the Old Testament law. They, they were saying, however, in a broader sense, you need to be more like us. You need to be more like me. You see, who God has called you to be is not enough. You need to be more like me. And their descendants are still in the church of the Lord today. Oh, they may not be going around telling you anything about circumcision one way or the other, but it's the same Spirit that says we're the ones that are really right with God. And if you really want to be right with the Lord, you've got to listen to the same podcast I listen to. If you really want to be right with the Lord, you need to go deeper in the Word. And by the way, there's a group in every church that thinks the Sunday school's not deep enough, the Sunday morning sermon's not deep enough, the Sunday night preaching's not deep enough, Wednesday night Bible study's not deep enough. If you really want to be right with God, Come to our house on Tuesday night. Come to our place on Thursday morning, and we're going to go deep into the Word of God. Now listen to me, friend. I'm all in favor of going deep into the Word of God. And I think that shallow Christianity is a scourge on the American church. But far too often, those who want you to be like them and walk in their steps are proud as a peacock and mean as a junkyard dog. I just stopped by long enough to tell you, nothing will frustrate you more than letting somebody else tell you that you need to run your race like they're running their race. You have a distinct assignment. Uh, I, I remember when I first became a pastor, I was still trying to find my own preaching voice, and I got up every Sunday morning. I wanted to be Herb Revis. Nothing necessarily wrong with that if your name is Herb Revis. But I quickly came to terms with the fact that I'm not Herb Revis. So I decided I wanted to be Rick Corum. <laughs> but I had too much hair. So then I said, I I'm going to be a an evangelist like Junior Hill. About that time, I said, no, I want to be like Adrian Rogers. And that's about the time that Dr. Rogers died. So I said, no, I don't want to be exactly like Adrian Rogers. But I soon came to realize there's only one preacher that God's called me to be. There's only one person that God's called me to be. And that is to be the best Mike Stone that God's grace would enable me to be. Now, Christian friend, God has something for you to do. And you need to realize that. You need to embrace it and be committed to do that for the glory of God. You can glorify the Lord by faithfully running the race. You have a distinct assignment. There's a second thing that we see in this text, and that is a divine approval. For Paul says, you were running well. This is one of the greatest Christians that ever lived that looked at their life and said, you are doing great. I was watching you. I was observing you. I was walking the Christian life with you, and you are doing awesome. 
And if you understand anything about the inspiration of the Scripture, with that now being in our Bible, it's not just Paul saying that. It's the Holy Spirit of God saying, here's a stamp of approval. You were running well. Now, every one of us longs for approval. That's just part of our human nature. Last Sunday evening, I went home. And as a preacher, I was really dejected. I didn't feel like either the morning or the evening service had gone any further than the front edge of the pulpit. I thought I had laid two eggs up here in the pulpit, and I got home, and my 11-year-old son said, Dad, those were two of the best messages I think you've ever preached. I thought, well, maybe you just don't know good preaching. But <laughs> Wednesday night... I spoke to the youth, and I was, I was tired. I didn't feel good. I was distracted by a number of things. And once again, I didn't think that that message went well, but I heard the next day the testimony of one of our students who left that service and talked about how God had really spoken to their heart. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't say that to fish for compliments I think all of us enjoy encouragement, and there's nothing wrong with encouraging one another. But what we should really strive for is not a mere mortal man saying you did well, but we should long for that day when the God-man himself says, I heard what you said, I saw what you did, and I know something they didn't know. I know why you did it, and I know if it was your best or not. And for him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. That ought to be the approval for which we long. And I remind you, as I've said in the past, in the Bible, there's no well done that is separated from good and faithful servant. There's nowhere in the Bible that we are promised that Jesus will merely say to us, well done. There's no well done unless it's well done, good and faithful servant. Paul testifies of this divine approval. On his deathbed, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, I fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And he said, it's not because I'm special. He said, that goes for everybody else who has loved his appearing. And if you know what Paul was going to do with that crown of righteousness, if you know what the Bible teaches you will do with all of your trophies, awards, and crowns, you'll long for the soul winner's crown. You'll long to receive the crown of life. You'll long to receive the crown of perseverance when you realize that what we're going to do with that crown, we're going to take them off our head and we're going to lay them at the nail-pierced feet of the Lord Jesus Christ as a way of acknowledging, Lord, anything that I accomplished for your glory, it wasn't me doing it, it was you doing it through me. And all the honor, praise, and glory belongs to you and to you alone. I just want to say at the outset of the message, faithfully running the race is not an unattainable goal. There's glory in a faithful race. He said, you were running well. But there's a second truth we see in this text. Not only there's glory in a faithful race, there's grief over a faltering race. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? It's here that we begin to see the importance of the verb tenses. It's in the past. You were running well. Who hindered you? Here's someone that at one point in their life they were running well the Christian race. But now there are calluses on the heart, dust on the Bible and cobwebs over the entrance to the prayer closet. Like the backslidden believers of the church at Ephesus that we read in Revelation 2. Their doctrine may have been right. Their practice may have been right. But their hearts had grown cold. 
And they had left their first love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now as Paul addresses their faltering race, there are two things I want to bring out of the text. Number one, the obstacle in your path. Look again in verse 7. You were running well. Who hindered you? The word hindered has a couple of meanings in the Greek of the New Testament. Uh, Some suggest that it means to cut in on. You've got the picture of a runner running the race. You've seen the the track that that, that goes around the the practice football field. And and there are clearly delineated lines and lanes. He said, you are running really well in your lane. And somebody apparently cut in on you. Tripped you up and made you fall. Who was that that cut in on you? If you've ever driven on Highway 84 between here and Waycross, you know what it's like to have somebody cut in on you. you got your cruise control set on 65 miles an hour. I know that's speeding, but you got your cruise control set on 65. And somebody pulls out in front of you just in time to be going 15 miles an hour as you land on your brakes and standing everybody in the car up on their head. They go two blocks and turn. That's somebody that cuts you off. They cut in on you. This word was also used as a military term. It describes an army in retreat tearing up the road. If you think about it, an army that's in retreat, they blow up bridges and they tear up roads and they leave landmines and obstructions. If a tank runs out of gas, they just leave it right, right there in the middle of the road. They, they want to leave a bunch of obstacles and hardship for that encroaching army as they come. Paul said, you are advancing so well in the army of God. Who was it that left an obstacle in your path that you're having trouble getting around? Who was it that blew up the bridge on the road of your faithfulness? Who was it that you allowed to be a hindrance to you? It's very instructive that he does not say what hindered you. Who hindered you? And I dare say if you think there's a what that hindered you, there's a who behind that what. And it's really the who that whatted the what. Somebody say amen. Now again, the historical context here is clear. The who were the Judaizers who came in and began to teach false doctrine. Paul knows the answer to his own question. John MacArthur comments here that the question, who hindered you, was rhetorical. Uh, Students, that means he asked the question, but he already knew the answer to it. He knew the answer were were the Judaizers. The question who hindered you was rhetorical. The question was not about the identity of the false teachers, but about their having been able to so easily and quickly deceive and mislead the Galatian believers. It's not who are they, but who are they to have caused you to stop serving the Lord. I can't tell you the number of times in my ministry that I've heard people say, I tell you why I'm not serving the Lord, it's because of so and so. Well, who are they? Did they die on the cross for your sin? Did they rise from the dead so that you could be redeemed? Who are they? And very practically, I've known really Big guys. I'm talking about big physical guys. Big, broad, chiseled, six-pack abs. Big, strapping rednecks. Say they wouldn't come to church here because of me. <laughs> or worse yet, some, some, something a 65-year-old woman about as big around as my pinky said to them in the nursery one day when they went to pick up their child. Well, I just imagine for a moment if I met that big old guy out in the parking lot. I said, listen to, son, listen to me, son. If you think you're walking in that church, I'll whip you right here in the parking lot. He'd say, let's get it on right here. He would never physically allow me to be a hindrance to him coming to the Lord's house. But yet we do that all the time, don't we? 
Sometimes it's not even a person or a threat, it's just a word. Again, it may have been a sideways glance when you picked up your kid in the nursery. Or maybe when you went to the preschool department, somebody said, you'd think if you're going to put your kid and God's kids every week, you could at least take a turn once a quarter to help us out in here, bless God. I don't hear that a lot, and when something like that is said, I hate that as much as you do. But Paul says, really? You're going to let that keep you from serving Jesus? If you follow the Olympics at all, you may know the name Mary Decker. In 1982, she was considered to be the fastest female runner in the world in every race from 800 meters to 10,000 meters. She was on the cover of a number of American magazines and was noted as America's running superwoman. Yet she did not have an Olympic medal. She had to lay out the 1976 Olympics because of an injury. In 1980, some of you are old enough to remember when President Carter boycotted the Olympic Games. In 1984, everybody thought this is her year. She's going to win the gold And her best chance was in the 3,000 meter race. But there was another runner in that race, a barefooted runner named Zola Budd. Zola came around one of the corners and changed lanes, got in front of Mary Decker, and Mary Decker fell. She fell to the track, injured her hip, and did not finish the race. They initially disqualified Zola Budd. They said that she cut in and made an illegal move. But they watched the video and found out her move was not illegal at all. But for years, Mary Decker continued to blame Zola Budd for cutting in on her until an interview with the New York Times in 2010. It was then that Mary Decker, the injured runner, the one that had been cut in on, She told the New York Times, and I quote, The reason I fell, the reason I fell, some people think she tripped me. I happen to know that wasn't the case at all. The reason I fell is because I am and was very inexperienced in running in a pack. End quote. Here's what she said. She said, the reason that I tripped was because I basically was so much better than everybody else. I was always out in front. I never had to run that close to anybody. And so when somebody finally got that close to me, I I didn't know how to maneuver when somebody started to move into my lane. She made a legal move, and I didn't know how to. It was all my fault. There may be one numbered among God's people today who needs to know while they may have cut in on you, you are responsible for how you responded to the cut, the obstacle in your path. For someone in the room today, it wasn't a false teacher and it wasn't some church offense. The person that cut in on you may have been a ball coach that offered your child a spot on the team. And didn't realize they just cut in on you. It may have been a business owner who offered you a job or a boss who offered you a promotion not realizing they just cut in on you. It may have been a boyfriend or a girlfriend, an ex-husband or an ex-wife. Maybe a friend with the best of intentions invited you to join them at the lake instead of going to church this weekend and didn't realize they planted seeds of disobedience in your heart that cut in on you and busted up the road on the path of obedience. It may well have been someone who whispered something unkind about the pastor or a leader in the church, perhaps not even fully realizing the damage that was going to do in your own spiritual development. Paul said, you were running well. Who is it that you allowed to hinder you? And why are you allowing them 
to stand between you and God. The obstacle in your path. But oh, there's grief in a faltering race. Secondly, because of the obedience in your past. The question is very probing and pointed. You were running well. Who who hindered you? Now notice he does not say, who hindered you from having a great life? He doesn't say, who hindered you from being successful? He says, who hindered you from obeying the truth? Now, a testimony of obeying the truth is a wonderful testimony unless it's in the past tense. I heard about two young men who went to work for the DOT. They were hired to paint yellow stripes down the center of the road. And their job required that they paint a minimum of two miles per day. And so these boys showed up with their paint can and their paint brushes. And man, that first day they painted not two, not three, but four miles of yellow stripe. Their supervisor was tickled, I guess tickled yellow. The next day they came and they painted two miles. He thought, well, that's half what they did the day before, but it's still meeting the requirement. The third day they showed up and they painted a half a mile. He thought, I'm going to nip this thing in the bud before we get a real big problem. He brought them into the supervisor's trailer. The first day, four miles. The second day, two miles. Today, only a half mile. What's the problem? They said, we keep getting further and further away from the paint can. Some of us have gotten too far away from the bucket. And we're running less and less and doing less and less. It's not that the race is in the past. It's that the obedience is in the past. Now I promise you in the name of the Lord Jesus, I have nobody in mind when I say what I'm about to say. Not a single soul. But just based on the size of this crowd, some in this room used to be faithful soul winners. cut in on you and hindered you from obeying the truth. Some of you used to teach Sunday school. Some of you used to work in Awana. Some of you used to never miss a Sunday night service. There's, there's such a sweet fellowship. I love Sunday morning, but there's, there's, there's something that's just a little different on Sunday. There was a time you would have never missed a 6 o'clock service. Who, who cut in on you? Who hindered you? There was a time that you were faithful in tithes and offerings. Was it a stewardship sermon that cut in on you? Was it a special emphasis that got in your crawl? Who is it that has hindered you from running well? Now, I know that sometimes age and sickness take their toll. I'm I'm older today than I've ever been before. And I can now share testimony with some of you that sometimes when you get tired, it just takes a whole lot longer to, to get your strength back. I understand that for some of us, age and sickness can be an issue. I mentioned in the first service. Uh, that uh, our dear brother Robert Westbury turned 102 this past weekend. There was a time that brother Robert used to be the most faithful man in our choir. There was a time he was the only man in the choir. Brother Andrew, he was the tenor and the bass section. He's not in the choir anymore. But he's still a faithful follower of Jesus. You may not be able to run every bit as fast as you used to run, but you can run every bit as faithfully as you've ever run before. So please understand, I'm not talking about anybody today that's 102 years old. I'm really just talking to the rest of us. You were running well. Who hindered you? from obeying the truth. There's glory in a faithful race. There's grief 
over a faltering race. But hallelujah for verse 8, there's grace for a further race. Paul doesn't just leave them with a rebuke. He extends a hand of mercy. And like a good coach, he invites them to get back on the team. To get back on the track. To suit up again. Lace up your sneakers and get back in the race. You see, child of God, Abraham lied about his wife, but God still used him. David committed sexual sin and murder. God still used him. Moses murdered an Egyptian and buried him in the sands of the desert, but God still used him. Peter denied the Lord. Thomas doubted the Lord. Most of them deserted the Lord. And all of us have disobeyed the Lord. Well, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but I'm glad today I don't serve a God who's a, who's a one-strike-and-you're-out kind of God. He's not even a three-strikes-and-you're-out kind of God. You ever heard a preacher describe him as the God of a second chance? He's way better than that. I blew my second chance a long time ago. He's the God of another chance. Paul told the Corinthians, such were some of you. Paul told the Romans where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And Paul told the Colossian believers that at Calvary's cross, God the Son took the list of all of our offenses we had committed against God and He nullified them by nailing them to His cross. You could say He nullified them by nailifying them. But He extends to us today grace for a further race. Friend, lean in close and listen to the preacher today. You had not been too bad, gone too far, done too much that God will not invite you back into a faithful life of Christian service. There's grace for a further race. As we examine verse 8, I want to point out two simple things and we're done. First of all, I see there's a mindset to fight off. After rebuking them for being hindered, verse 8, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. Persuasion. Uh, Now, when we use the word persuasion, we're usually talking about some opinion, some preference, some little hunch. You know, I'm persuaded that the Georgia Bulldogs will have a good year this year, or I'm I'm of the persuasion that it's going to be a good year for peanuts. I... I'm of the persuasion that you ought to buy gold. But that's not how the Bible uses the word persuasion. This word actually means a convictional belief. It's a rock-ribbed, sure-footed, stainless steel conviction of the soul. Paul would use this word writing to Timothy where he said, For I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. The writer to the Hebrews in chapter 6, after talking about the danger of apostasy and falling away from Christ, said, but we are persuaded of better things concerning you. Paul says, there's a mindset that you've got that you didn't get from Jesus. What is that mindset that did not come from Christ? Perhaps it's the mindset that says, well, I'm saved. And I know once saved, always saved. And God doesn't expect me to be perfect. And God doesn't have as high a standard as the preacher seems to. Nobody's going to be faithfully running the race all the time. There's nothing wrong with me failing and falling and faltering. That's just the way it is. Paul said, you didn't get that mindset from Jesus. The idea that mediocrity was acceptable in the sight of God. You may have gotten that from somewhere, but you didn't get that from Jesus. That's a mindset we've got to fight off. In his book, Finishing Strong, Steve Farrar tells a powerful, somewhat lengthy poem about a little boy 
who entered a race on field day. And man, he wanted to win that race. But he fell three different times and decided to give up. It's then that the poet begins to describe the little boy's condition. Defeated, he lay silently, a tear dropped from his eye. There's no sense running anymore. Three strikes, I'm out. Why try? The will to rise had disappeared. All hope had fled away. So far behind, so error prone, closer all the way. I've lost, so what's the use, he thought. I'll live with my disgrace. But then he thought about his dad, who soon he'd have to face. Get up! An echo sounded low. Get up and take your place. You were not meant for failure here. Get up and win the race. With borrowed will. Get up, he said. You haven't lost it all. For winning is no more than this. To rise each time you fall. So up he arose to win once more. And with a new commit. He resolved that win or lose, at least he would not quit. So far behind the others now, the most he'd ever been, still he gave it all he had and ran as though he'd win. Three times he'd fallen, stumbling. Three times he rose again. Too far behind to hope to win, he still ran to the end. They cheered the winning runner as he crossed. They said, first place, head high, all proud and happy, no falling, no disgrace. But when this fallen youngster crossed the line, they all said last place. But the crowd gave him the greater cheer for finishing the race. And even though he came in last with head bowed, unproud, You would have thought he'd won that race to have listened to the crowd. And to his dad, he sadly said, I didn't do so well. To me, you won, his father said. You rose each time you fell. And now when things seem dark and hard, too difficult to face, the memory of that little boy helps me to run my race. For all of life is like that race with ups and downs and all. And all you have to do to win is rise each time you fall. Quit. Give up. You're beaten. They still shout in my face. But another voice above me cries out. Get up and run your race. If you have fallen and you think that's acceptable... If you're mediocre and you think that's acceptable. If you're in and out, off and on, up and down, hot and cold, and you think that's normal. The Holy Ghost through Paul says, you did not get that persuasion from the Lord. There's a mindset to fight off. And finally, there's a master to focus on. For you did not get this persuasion from Him who calls you. Now we're in shouting territory right here. You remember I told you how important the verb tenses are? Almost all of this section of Scripture is in the past tense. Except one thing. You were running well. Somebody cut in on you. Somebody hindered you. You're not running well anymore. You've got a mindset from the past that doesn't honor the Lord. It's all in the past except one thing. Their conversion is in the past. Their commitment is in the past. Their faithfulness is in the past. Their obedience to truth is in the past. Their right mindset is now all in the past. But there's one thing still in the present, and that is the call of God. He says, this persuasion did not come from Him who calls you. Brothers and sisters, your faithfulness may be in the past. His faithfulness is in the present. 
Your commitment to Him may be in the past. His commitment to you is still in the present. Your love for Him may be in the past. His love for you is still in the present. The Bible says, my God is a refuge and a strength. Listen, He is a very present help. In time of trouble. And the God who is indeed the great I Am, who is always present, is always presently calling, get up, come home, get back in the race. I'm not done with you. I'm not finished with you. There's a work for you to do. Get up and get back in the race. The writer to the Hebrews put it like this, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. One of my favorite stories to tell is taken from the world of high school athletics. It was 2010 in the state of California. Holland Reynolds was deemed to be the fastest girls runner in the state. And just before the track and field season began, their coach shared with the girls that his ALS, his Lou Gehrig's disease, had gotten a whole lot worse. This would be his last season. He was going to retire on medical retirement at the end of the season. And those girls got together and did what you would expect high school girls to do. Full of emotion and love for their coach, they determined we're going to win the state title and send our coach into retirement as a champion. And they raced their hardest and their fastest all year long. And in a story that is chronicled both by the New York Times and ABC News, you can find a picture of some of this story on the internet. They come all the way to the last race, the last tournament, on the last day of the season. And their team is in first place. They stand ready to win the state title. All they have to do is finish this race. It's a multi-runner race, and guess who's running the last leg of that race? The star runner in the state, Holland Reynolds. They expected her to win. So they were all surprised when one runner after another crossed the finish line, and Holland was nowhere in sight. They began to grow concerned about her when finally off on the horizon, they see her running around the corner. But it's obvious to anybody with eyes to see, she was injured. She was hurting. There was this strange limp and gait. They tell she was in trouble. They ran to her, but she, she waved them off. She knew, if you touch me, I'm disqualified. We don't win. We don't get any points for this event, and we don't win the state title. So they're running, walking right beside her, but they're not touching her. And she keeps waving them off, waving them off, waving them off, until finally she collapses two yards away from the finish line. And this skilled, able athlete, the star youth runner in the whole state, took 20 seconds to crawl six feet across the finish line. They scooped her up and placed her in the back of a waiting ambulance. That's the picture you can find on the internet today. And one reporter asked her, what was she thinking about? How great was the pain? And she responded that she didn't think about the pain at all. All she thought about was her coach on the other side of that finish line. And she wanted to give him a trophy. And I came this morning to tell you, one day you're going to cross the finish line in the race of life. And there's a nail-scarred man named Jesus on the other side of that line. And I want a trophy to lay at his feet. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? You did not get that persuasion from him, but thank God... That hymn is still calling you. 